Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome. Today we'll be looking at He actually never left. He actually never left. He came back as the Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ coming back as the Spirit upon His resurrection. We'll be looking at the scriptures. We'll be looking at the different angles of what the Lord became in our resurrection. The Lord Himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the mystery of God. The scripture tells us that. And it, um, he said in Matthew 11, 27, he said that no one knows the Father except the Son, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And it is the one in whom the Son has revealed to. Is the mystery of God is very complicated to the human understanding. He has to reveal himself. Very wonderful, very mysterious, because we see some other part that, hey, he's called the Father. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, unto us a child is born, a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, it shall be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, the everlasting father, the eternal father, and the prince of peace. And of course, we see that whatever you and I know of the Lord Jesus Christ today is still infinitely below, far, far, far below what he actually is. It's just we are at the mercy of whatever he reveals him or whatever he reveals to us. Little wonder Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, I believe that uh, that uh, does, uh, that he count all things but dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ is beyond what the human that's why even Ephesians 3 calls it the unsearchable riches of Christ so it's also called the son which is very obvious that he is the son of God and it's also addressed and called the spirit he actually called himself the spirit in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 so it's very very mysterious because you're wondering is it the father is it we know is the son is obvious i mean from scripture is it the spirit as well yes because the bible tells us so <laughs> Uh, the Lord and uh, the Word of God is called the mystery of God in Colossians 2. It's called also Colossians 2. Neither is the embodiment of the fullness of the God. That is the that is the fullness of the God dwell, Godhead dwells in him bodily. And in John chapter 14, very mysterious chapter which we are going to be going to. It's actually the heart of what we are looking at today because in that John 14, it was, I mean, the disciples were asking that, is it, he was telling the disciples that invariably that, look, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. If you know me, you know the Father. Stop asking for the father outside of me i paraphrase that so and the disciples were like what well, show us the father and so he was saying that they of course he said it that he's in the father and the father is in him as i nice is calls him the eternal father we don't have two eternal fathers in the kingdom of god so we see is a very mysterious uh being and but what the joy we have him as our lord and our savior so we're going right ahead when we say he actually never left we are talking about what he became in resurrection because in john, john 14 he told the disciples was going away and he was coming back he kept on saying i'm going i'm coming that he was going and he was going to come back so we believe at least going by what we have in different accounts in the scriptures putting the scriptures together because um the scriptures the way god says it that here a little there a little like a jigsaw puzzle god puts the truth around because our human brain it's incapable of comprehending any section or any topic regarding the truth in its whole entirety that's why god really puts everything about uh, a particular topic in one part of the bible or in one part of the scripture it's just here a little there a little precept upon precept and it's the mystery but of course it takes the lord himself by his spirit to reveal it to all so uh first timothy 3 16 says is god manifest in the flesh great is the mystery of godliness god was manifest in the flesh god was manifest in the flesh <laughs> justified in the spirit sin of angels spirit to the gentiles believe up into the world and receive up into glory the god that manifested in the flesh is the lord jesus christ john 1 1 say in the beginning was the world the world was with god and the world was god john 1 14 say and the world became flesh the world became flesh so god in christ became flesh it's a mystery in the mystery of incarnation and in first corinthians 15 he is the last adam who became a life-giving spirit this is what the scripture says. I mean, we dare not say that the Lord is the Spirit if the scripture doesn't say that. 2 Corinthians 3 17 say now the Lord is the Spirit now the Lord is the Spirit so he departed in one form and came right back in another form we believe that that's actually what happened that that was why in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when the Holy Spirit through Paul was um, giving the account and before we got to 1 Corinthians 15 45 where he said the, the first Adam was made a living soul the last Adam became a life-giving spirit you could see from the like a prologue or the preceding uh, verses before that period um, 
it was being said that if you plant a seed it doesn't come forth as a fruit in itself god gives it its body that whatever you sow in corruption that he was the one that was we believe the scripture was saying was sown in corruption that he was going to be uh, that was resurrected in incorruption of course it's because he bared our sin the humanity it had to go through death but in resurrecting the scripture now says the last adam became a life-giving spirit what a mystery so this is the pneumatic christ the church fathers came up with the term pneumatic pneumatic means a like in Ephesians chapter 4 where it says that the same person that ascended is the one that descended and he that descended is the one that ascended that he might fill all things with himself so there's no place it's not today that's why the church fathers in the early century the second and third centuries came up with the term the pneumatic Christ that is the Christ that fills everywhere with himself it's not a strange doctrine it's like saying the boundless Christ or the unsearchable Christ so the pneuma, pneuma is just a Greek word for them to describe that this is what the Lord became upon resurrection and they use this term because of course there are scriptures to corroborate that second Corinthians 3 17 that now the Lord is the spirit the last Adam became a life-giving spirit and there are many other scriptures we'll be looking at in today so be very patient with us so Christ came back as the spirit Though he said he was going, but his going was just his coming from coming back in another form. It's like a grain of wheat or a seed, for example. In John 12 24, he said it is the grain of wheat actually. If you pick if I put a, an apple seed in my hand and the apple seed could speak, it could tell me that look, I'm going, but I'm coming back again. Of course, the apple seed is going and by planting it in under the ground, it's going. It's going through death, but it's going to resurrect again. God is going to give it life again. And we believe that was the picture the Lord was painting in John 12, 24. So here's John chapter 14, where he said that, And if I go away, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. So he wasn't actually going. That's why we said he actually never left because he left. Yes, technically he never because he went and in three days time he was back again. He was back in another form. He was back in the form because he breathed into the disciples that receive ye the Spirit of God. And we go through Acts 2.33 where he received the promised Holy Spirit from the Father. And he now poured it out on the disciples. But we don't want to jump ahead of ourselves. But he was giving an hint about this that if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And he went further from 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I will not leave you comfortless or as orphans. I will come to you somebody is leaving and he's telling us he's coming back of course he technically he wasn't actually leaving because he was going but he was coming back in another form you have heard me say to you i am going away and coming back to you this is in john chapter 14 and you could go through this it's it's very loaded so you can see we just picked out the areas where he mentioned that he was coming back again so he is with us today that's why galatians 2 2 can say that christ lives and yet not i christ lives in me we could see that for to me to live is christ philippians chapter 1 also all through the scripture christ who is our life colossians chapter 3 so we see the lord jesus christ be with your spirit all through the scriptures we see there in the new testament that the lord is with us today our very present help in time of need so going ahead as well he also said that after his resurrection christ came back to his disciples in order to enter into them so he came back to the disciples in a bit to enter he could not enter into the disciples except he went through death he had to pass through death like that grain of wheat because his intention part of his goal and part of the agenda of god was that he was going to reproduce himself duplicate himself but he's going to be true an indwelling savior there was no way he could duplicate himself except he dies as the grain of wheat comes back to now reside in our heart so he now begins to conform us and transform us from the inside so that's why ephesians chapter 3 says that we will be strengthened with might by his spirit in our inner man the next verse he now said that christ making his home in our heart so when he said when he said when he has said this he breathed on them and said receive ye the holy spirit john 20 22 because he received the spirit from the father acts 2 33 he received the promised spirit from the father so upon receiving the promised spirit from the father he poured out the spirit upon us his disciples but it might look like it very as if it's foggy but just be very patient because we, as we're going through the different scriptures the lord by himself will make it uh will make it clearer to us there is the word of god is boundless it takes the spirit of god to open our understanding to the different sides of uh, his world so upon his ascension and enthronement he received the holy spirit from the father 
and thus poured out himself on his disciples on the day of Pentecost. So there are two forms we receive the Holy Spirit. It's still the same Spirit. Ephesians 4, 4 tells us that there's one body, there's one Spirit, one Lord, one Father, one God over all, one baptism. So it's still the same one Spirit. We don't have the Spirit of the Holy Spirit here, the Spirit of Jesus Christ here, the, the, the Spirit of God here. It's one Spirit that we have. But we receive that one spirit in two aspects. There is a part where we, uh, the, or the, the, the two aspects stated in scriptures that the disciples that were represent, they were representing us in the picture because they were representing the body of Christ. In John 20, 22, when the Lord breathed into the disciples, He came into them as the spirit of life. Then in Acts chapter 2, this time it wasn't a breathing, but it was pouring out of the spirit that is baptizing them into the spirit or baptizing them into his body but let's just take it gently as we go ahead so he's this Acts 2 33 where the scripture mentioned that he received the spirit from the father therefore being exalted to the right hand of god and having received from the father the promise of the holy spirit he poured out this which you now see and hear I mentioned earlier on about the fact that God, uh, from the scriptures, I mean, you can tell as well as a good Bible student that they are, the truths of God are, um, it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle. The truths are here, little, there, little. And how are we going to know this? Because in 2 Corinthians 3 17, the scripture says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. So he received the Spirit from the Father upon resurrection and he now poured the Spirit on the disciples, which is what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So there's the infilling which happened where he breathed and put the disciples in John 20 22, and there is the outpouring which happened in Acts 2 33. Also, first, he breathed himself into the disciples as a spirit of life on the day of resurrection. So, on the day of resurrection in John 20, 22, he breathed into them, receive ye the spirit. Second, he now poured himself on the disciples as the spirit of power on the day of Pentecost, thus baptizing them into his body. And actually, a picture of this was, we could say, was what, we, what happened to the Lord in the picture. Because when he came in his earthly ministry, the three are one essentially. First John 5 7, there are three that bear records in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. It's a mystery, the mystery of the Godhead of the Trinity. We won't go into it because it's so much a loaded part, but just look at it that God in Christ by the Spirit coming to man. And so, the, when He came, He was conceived of the Holy Spirit in His incarnation in Matthew chapter 1. Now, upon is uh, upon beginning his ministry the earthly ministry the baptism that john the baptist baptizing the spirit came upon him and that's what the church fathers call the economical spirit that is the spirit that enables us to carry out the work of the great commission so there's the spirit for life which he was conceived with it's still the same spirit of god and there's the spirit for of power which is to carry out the work of god so that's the picture what happened to him in his earthly ministry that is now happening to the disciples and it's also happening to us today it's a one-time experience but the infilling is a continuous thing so firstly he breathed himself into the disciples as the spirit of life on the day of resurrection two days the day of resurrection 50 days later the day of pentecost he poured himself upon his disciples as the spirit of power baptizing them into his body if you go through first uh, corinthians 12 13 that of one spirit we have been made to drink so it's like we've been baptized essentially into one body but we make it sometimes as we are going along some of it will be repeating it in another dimension just to make it the Lord make to make it clear to us in the flesh he couldn't live in his disciples but as the spirit he can live in us there was no way he could live in us as they in his mother that's why I said it is expedient that I go away if I don't go I can't come back in another form it sounded like he was sending somebody else it sounded like he was sending another I know because it's that that the Holy Ghost the helper the, 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 the another the another helper the Holy the spirit of truth whom the father will send in my name that every word the Lord speaks, every word in scripture is very important. Every phase is very important. He said the Father was going to send the Spirit in His name. That's mysterious on its death. So we now go to other part of the scripture. What does it mean by sending the, that the Spirit is coming in His name? We get to Acts 2.33. We now see that He received the Spirit from the Father. So invariably we can infer that, safely infer that He came back as the Spirit. 
because 2 Corinthians 3 7, they say, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And in Revelation 2, Revelation 3, the Lord Jesus Himself called Himself the Spirit seven times. Seven times He called Himself the Spirit. Say, He who has an ear, let Him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So He actually never, technically, He didn't leave because He would not leave us. Why would He die for us, go through the gruesome death He went through, and just leave us here on the earth? I probably could trust nobody to transform us he could tra that's why i said he won't leave us comfortless he won't leave us without an offer he said it was better he goes away because he knew if he were if he, if he remained with them he was just an outward savior externally but he wanted to be in also that in his disciples in his believers and what a joy so now the lord is the spirit the spirit of god is now the spirit of christ the spirit of jesus Christ, the Spirit of God's Son and Christ Himself. And there are scriptures, of course, you know that I'm sure you are a good Bible student, you will have seen this scripture, this Spirit of Christ, like in Philippians chapter 1, this is the bountiful supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, Acts chapter 16, verse 6 and 7. Acts 16, 6 and 7, in verse 6, it says that the Holy Spirit forbid them, Paul and his crew, from going to Asia. In verse 7, <laughs> the time the Holy Spirit knew was like the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. <laughs> so we can say that, oh, we have the Spirit of God in one side of our spirit and we have the Spirit of Jesus Christ. F Ephesians 4, 4 says there is one Spirit. So the Spirit we can infer because He received the Spirit from the Father and 2 Corinthians three seventeen actually nails it to me. There are three scriptures that stands um, like grade A scriptures, I would say, when it comes to the Lord being the Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ being the Spirit. When I mean grade A, I'm not really the scriptures against themselves i'm just saying grade a means that to me my opinion is like very direct that the lord we don't have to use four five verses to put them together this was very direct second corinthians 3 17 now the lord is the spirit first second one second scripture i might say is the uh, first corinthians 15 45 the last adam became a life-giving spirit became a life-giving spirit and revelate the third one i could say is uh, revelations chapter 2 revelation chapter 3 where the lord himself called Calls himself the Spirit seven times, and there are now other verses, other scriptures in the Bible where that's the essence of part part of what we are going through. We are not trying to prove anything. It's we are just trying to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. We can praise Him as our healer. We can praise Him as our physician. We can praise Him as our tower of refuge. We can praise Him as our provider. We can praise Him as our teacher. But in this context, we are praising Him as the Spirit. Now the Lord is the Spirit. That the Lord Himself is the Holy Spirit. That is inside of us today the lord himself and we go through the scripture we go through the scriptures it's because the lord himself is very mysterious it takes only him to open the mystery of his word into our heart so it's called the spirit of of christ in romans chapter 8 9 to 11 the spirit of jesus Act 6, 17, the Spirit of God's Son, Galatians chapter 4 from verse 4 to 6. We will go through that before the end of this scripture and Christ himself. So going ahead from uh, what we've been reading. But you are, this is Romans chapter 8. So let's look at this. But you are not in the flesh, but Romans 8 from 9 to 10. To 11. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So we see how the Lord himself was using, interchange. God is at liberty to use whatever title he wants for himself. In some contexts, he will say it's the Spirit of God. In another context, he says it's the Spirit of Christ. In another context, he will say it's Christ. So here's a very good example of those speeds. He says, if you are, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not of his. The Spirit of God now, the terminology is now being changed. It's the same person being changed to the Spirit of Christ. And all of a sudden, the next verse, and he said, if Christ is in you. So who is in us? Is it the Spirit of God? Because it says, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. So if there's a multiple choice question that we could ask, who is dwelling in the believer? Is it the Spirit of God? Because it said the Spirit of God dwells in you, multiple choice A, multiple choice B. Is it the Spirit of Christ? <laughs> multiple choice C, is it Christ? <laughs> it's because it's one Spirit. Multiple choice D is like it's still the Lord and the Spirit is just now the Lord is the Spirit, they are just one. So God could say the Spirit of God is dwelling in us and we don't think that we have different spirits in different sides of us because Ephesians, that will contravene scriptures because scripture say there's one Spirit and also making us to realize, he said that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. He didn't say greater is them or are they that are in not he say he because it's just one the lord being the spirit 
2 Timothy 4 22 it says the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit 1 Corinthians 6 17 also say but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him so it's all true in the Bible so the Lord himself being the spirit so we can go through all that one so here is Ephesians chapter 3 16 17 also another example we could use and that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man the next verse verse 17 that christ may dwell in your heart by faith so who is dwelling in the inner man of the believer or, 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 or in our heart in our spirit who is dwelling in verse 16 the holy spirit calls it the spirit is spirit and in verse 17 he said christ dwelling in us is because the lord is the spirit so he could decide to use whatever terminology he has for himself and we pray that it takes and especially when we come across reading the bible a lot of the time if god doesn't open our eyes in first corinthians chapter 2 where he mentioned that no one can know the things of god except god reveals it so it takes the lord opening our eyes that we are not the it's not just the black and white not just the letter kill it only the spirit gives life and it takes god himself to open our understanding so that we begin to glorify the Lord in another dimension, in another higher rating based on scriptures. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. This is in John chapter 14. He said, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Let's take this a little bit. Let's take a pause here. If the Lord says that, to you or to me to anyone that you know a thing he cannot be lying he said the world cannot see him because he neither sees him nor knows him he now told the disciple but you know him as of that period we can't say that the uh we can't say that the disciples actually i mean i don't want to say knew the holy spirit at that period because it was in john 20 22 he breathed into them but he said you know him and the next sentence he said for he dwells with you i believe in my opinion that he was talking about himself that you know him because earlier on he had told them that if you know me you know the father if you see me you've seen the father i don't think they really understood what he was saying but he told them anyway i mean the father the father is in me and later on it was no longer the father he was comparing and saying that look i'm the father in the midst of you because i'm in the father and the father is in me this time from verse 16 17 18 and onward this time is now making a comparison with him and the spirit the holy spirit say for you know him so if you take a pause for example and said the lord if we were there let's imagine one of if one of them was very inclusive to say that lord are you the spirit because you say we know you you are not talking of a future participle here you say for he dwells with you we are dwelling with you then you definitely would think you are the spirit and you say and we be in you it's not already in them look at the preposition with in is with them at the moment before his death and externally but he said and will be that means a future participant that means he was going through a process so as to come inside of the disciples and that's why he's living in us today that's why scripture say but he was joined to the lord is one spirit with him so but you know him we believe he was talking about himself and for he dwells with you we believe the he that was dwelling with them here is the same person that was coming inside of them which was him in another form that's why he said i am going away and coming back to you first, God having raised up his servant, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquity. This is Acts 3, 26, that the father sent him back. This was upon his ascension, that the father sent him back to be a blessing. That's why it's the blessing of the gospel in Galatians 3. The very Christ who was initially sent in the flesh has now been sent as the spirit for our transformation. That's why in that 2 Corinthians 3, 7, they said that we behold him as in the glad, we are being transformed from glory to glory, even as by the lord who is the spirit as the niv version put it and of course in verse 17 he had mentioned that now the lord is the spirit in chapter 14 but the helper the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name john 14 26 that the helper the holy spirit will whom the father will send in my name and you know that the lord jesus christ came back he came in the name of the father he always says that he came in the, the father he came in the name of the father so we could infer that the spirit comes in the son's name meaning the son came as the spirit upon resurrection 
he came because there are scriptures, there are scriptures all through scripture that tells us that John in uh, 1 2 Corinthians 3 17, now the Lord is the Spirit. So he comes in the name of the Father in his incarnation to carry out redemption. Now we said in John 14 26 that the Father will send the Spirit in his name. Which we mean that in his person, because he said, in, because we see scriptures that corroborate. If this was just alone, that we can't, there are no scriptures to support it, then we leave it alone. But when we now see other overwhelming scriptures all through the New Testament, that the Lord being the Spirit, that he received the Spirit from the Father. So the Father came in the Son, the Son now comes as the Spirit. Because of course, the Father came in the Son, God was manifest in the flesh, the God was manifest in the flesh, and now the Son now comes as the Spirit. The Son came in the name of the Father. The Spirit is sent in the name of the Son. Very mysterious union because 1 John 5, 7 says that these three are one. It's very mysterious, the relationship between the Father, God as a Father, as the Son, and as the Holy Spirit. We have a different video on that. And God as a Father, God as a Son, God as a Spirit, the Divine Trinity also working as one. About two or three other videos where we uh, where we looked at different sides of the scriptures based on, we're, we're leaning on the shoulders of a lot of the work from the Church Fathers and also uh, Brother Witness Lee of the Living Stream Ministry. They've done extensive studies about this. The Lord has shown them a lot of things. And it's not just it's, it's not just knowledge we're trying to dispense, but basically for us to be able to pray through some of these scriptures, the Lord, we, as you pray through some of them, the Lord of virtually what you're hearing, even when we are reading the Bible or any Christian literature, any anointed material, we are praying over those things so that the Lord himself will open our eyes to deeper things. It's far beyond this, I believe. The Lord being the Spirit is still far, far beyond because I don't think anyone can comprehend who the Lord Jesus Christ fully is. But He wants us to grow in the knowledge of Him. That's why Paul was praying that He count all things but dunk for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. The Father came in and as the Son, in incarnation, and the Son as the embodiment of the Father has now come as the Spirit upon resurrection. Because the Father, he said in John 14, I am not alone. He said that I, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. <laughs> so the Father came in the Son and asked the Son, because he said that I can of my own self do nothing. He said in John 10, 30, that I and the Father are one. So the Son now has now come as the Spirit because the scripture says now the Lord and the Son calls it, or the Lamb called himself the Spirit, the Son in Revelation uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3 as well. So the three are never separated. When one moves, the other two are with that one. And when one is sent, the other two come with the sent one. They, are, they coexist and they coin here. Coexist is that they exist from eternity past till now, till eternity future and they also coined they live in each other it's very mysterious it's very hard for me to say that i uh, will see um here's the holy spirit here here's jesus here our lord jesus and here's the father here. i think it's very very positive i think when we get to eternity with the lord in uh, in, in eternity future i'm sure i'm sure just as philip asked that shows the father and he said that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I believe in eternity future when we get to heaven. If we ask him that same question that where is the Father, I believe his answer is going to be the same. Say stop asking, he's probably going to tell us stop asking for the Father outside of me. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. I told you in Isaiah 9, 6 that a son is going to be born, a son is going to be given, a child is going to be born, a son is going to be given, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. So I would I believe him. That's just my personal opinion. He's going to give us the same response he gave to Philip then, because we think they are separate. Yes, they are distinct, but they are inseparable. How I don't know. It's just a mysterious union. For there are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So the this Jesus at God raised up, wherefore we are all witnesses that therefore being at the right hand of God and having received of the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he poured out this which you now receive, Acts 2.33. Actually, the next 15, 16 uh, slides that we have were a video teaching which we had done, which is Christ as the Spirit, which is on our YouTube page. But of course, we didn't want to repeat everything that is in here. We didn't want to uh, pretty much rewrite this. That's why we're using the extract of this uh, to align with what we are saying that he actually never left. So it's almost like a part two on an updated version of the Christ as the Spirit. So the Son is the one who has the seven spirit. Revelation 3, chapter, verse 1 is the one who has the seven spirit. It's also the Lamb in Revelation 5, 6 that has the seven horns and seven eyes that are the seven spirits of God which are sent forth to the earth.
it's very mysterious that the eyes of the sun is the spirit the seven spirits before the throne and it's it's mysterious what happened when the lord resurrected it's a very big mystery but it takes the lord himself to open our eyes the son said seven times that he was and he let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches in revelation 2 and 3 today we are in the dispensation of christ as the spirit when he speaks he speaks as the spirit he who has an here, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So we're in that dispensation of Christ being the Spirit. Because to me, personally, I would say that the Lord is our Savior. And He's not just our Savior. He's our High Priest. He's our Advocate. He's our Righteousness. He's our Wisdom. Definitely, He's still the same Spirit that is in us. Because He's the one that, <laughs> he's the, <laughs> he's the one that the Father has committed all things into His hand. It's, it's, I think the reason why we, we, I found it difficult, I can speak for myself at least, that thinking that they were three that the son and the spirit were were separate to the extreme that it was like a different personality now we come through scriptures where the lord is calling himself the spirit and where the scripture is saying that now the lord is the spirit how can the three it's almost like what philip and was trying to and the disciples in john 14 no 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 the father is the father you are the one you are separate and he was trying their looks don't even go towards that side to try to divide them they are distinct but they are inseparable it's just a mystery that is beyond what our our human brain can comprehend but we worship him we adore him because we are we have a law that is beyond all comprehension the spirit today is the resurrected christ or the christ in resurrection or what the church father calls the pneumatic christ he became a man in incarnation for our redemption to pay the price for our penalties and he became his life-giving spirit upon his death and resurrection for our transformation so there are two becomings of christ the first becoming he became a man the world became flesh the second becoming first corinthians 15 16 15 45 the last adam becoming a life-giving spirit for our transformation he will be listening to me as the scriptures have said out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water this is in john 7 37 to 39 but this is spread concerning the spirit womb he whom those who believe into him were about to receive for the spirit was not yet because jesus had not yet been glorified and andrew Murray did another great book on uh, his book the spirit of christ i think the chapter three where he actually gave a serious explanation about the spirit was not yet in a lot of the translation you see the word giving not yet giving it was italicized and it was italicized because the uh, translators then we give credit to them they did a, they did an awesome god did use them mightily but in some context they italicize some words just to let us know that look this word didn't, the sentence didn't sound grammatical so we had to italicize they got it right in many cases but in this case it will sound like it was another spirit was another being from the lord himself so but the way the scripture was written was the spirit was not yet because jesus was yet to be glorified the lord was glorified when he entered his glory in resurrection going by luke 24 it was when he he entered his glory upon resurrection and that is when we became we believe he became the life-giving spirit going by first corinthians as well so through death and resurrection the son became the spirit the last adam became a life-giving spirit first the son sent the father the spirit the son sent the spirit then the son gave the spirit then eventually the son became the spirit thus the last adam became a life-giving spirit now we have now the lord is the spirit first it was what he sent the spirit in john 15 26 15 26 he said that i would this the spirit that we will send from the father john 14 26 said the father was going to send the spirit in the name of the son we go to john 15 26 <laughs> the son now said he's the one that's going to send the spirit from the father so who is sending the spirit is it the father john 14 26 or is it the son john 15 26 that's a mystery that is beyond our understanding. I think the answer to that is John 10, 30, that the Father and the Son, they are one. If the Father is sending the Spirit, the Son is the one sending the Spirit. If the Son is sending the Spirit, the Father is the one sending the Spirit. Because there is John 14, 26 telling us that the Father is the one that will send the Spirit. And in John 15, 26, <laughs> still the same book, the book of John. Now it is the Son that is sending the Spirit from the Father. It's because they are one. They are inseparable. I mean, the, let's not even try. The, the Lord said that the Father and I, uh, I and the Father are one. Is the Spirit for the purpose of dispensing himself into us for our transformation and conformation to his own image that we might be his expression on the earth so for him to transform us because of course we are the bride the church is believers and he is the bridegroom he has to prepare us how is he going to prepare us 
it's not just going to die for us for our redemption that was phase one but now the next phase is like it's now sanctifying us transforming us conforming us to his very image and he can't do that except it comes inside of us and it, there's no way we come inside of us except as the spirit because we have a spirit god gave man the spirit so as to have to be uh, as a medium a receptacle to receive god into them so there is no way it could come into us or indwell us without being the spirit there was no way that's why i say it was expedient for him to go away from art the spirit of god is also referred as to the spirit of jesus christ the spirit of life this lord spirit the spirit of the son of god like we said earlier on pyro resurrection the spirit of god was 100 percent divinity no element of humanity death or resurrection so because we have the spirit of god and i'm sure there's a question somebody will have in their heart but we have the spirit of god in the old testament did that spirit did this did the ministry cease when the lord jesus christ was raised? no no, because we still have the Holy Spirit. It's because we're thinking that these three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that they are three extreme God, which is Tritism, which the church father stamped as heiress in the early centuries. No, it's because they are one. First John 5 says that these three are one. God could decide to use the time as a father in a context, another place as the Son and as the Spirit, because it's still the same God. Ephesians 4, 6, that there's one God, there's one Father who is in true all, in all, and over all. Who is true, who is over all, through all and in all and it's just a mystery so the spirit of god in the old testament before the resurrection of the law was 100 percent divinity but because christ in his incarnation because he is god manifest in the flesh god was in christ reconciling the world to himself and he is filled with the spirit went through human living death and resurrection those elements of death and resurrection were compounded to the son so upon his resurrection, it's not just 100% divinity. He now has humanity with him, even till date. That's why I said, uh, this, this being referred as the son of man, even in Revelation chapter 1, it's also referred to as the son of man, because it's divinity plus humanity. That's why he's called the firstborn son of God from the dead, and we are his many brothers. He wasn't the firstborn son of God from the dead before resurrection. He was the only begotten of the father, which is 100% divinity from eternity past but when he became flesh and he went through death and resurrection he became the firstborn son of god from the dead and we are now his many brother because he had to become human so as to relate with us we he can now we can now be grafted into his body what a joy for what the lord has done Upon resurrection, the Spirit of God, along with His divinity, now has human element, death element, resurrection element. This does the scripture says that now the Lord is the Spirit. So, because the Spirit that God wanted to reside in His children, the Spirit is the Spirit that has gone through, or the Spirit was the Spirit of the Son of God that has gone through human living, death, and resurrection. So, He could relate with our infirmity because He's the one that went through it. That's why Galatians 4. Verse 6 says that, that God has now sent for the spirit of his son into our heart, crying out, Abba, Father. So, because it is the son that went through death and resurrection. And the son did not go through death and resurrection alone. Because Hebrews 9 tells us that he, by the eternal spirit, offered himself without, ble offered himself, uh, without blemish to God. To purge our conscience from every dead works. So, he went through death along with the spirit of, I didn't say the spirit of God died. I only said that it was his body. It was his physical body. First John, I think First Peter 3, 18 or thereabout. It was his body that went through death that was crucified. It it's the spirit of God cannot die. It is immortal. But the, because this, the scripture said in, in that Hebrews chapter 9, that, I think 9 14, that he by the eternal spirit offered himself to God so that he could purge our conscience from dead works. So this was the spirit that was not yet because Jesus was yet to be glorified because he hadn't gone through death and. Um, so we see a prefigure of this in Exodus 30, 23. I actually saw this from the Witness Lee, Brother Witness Lee, the Living Stream Ministry, from one of his materials. The Lord, I don't think there's any other person before him that was that that saw it the way God made the graphic, looking at the anointing oil in Exodus chapter 30, 23 to 25, because there God told Moses. And a lot of things we see in the New Testament, God has given types and shadows in the Old Testament. Just like Jesus said in Luke 24, when he was expounding the scriptures to the two disciples and showing them everything concerning himself. So in Acts 30, God was showing a picture that we could use this to signify the Holy Four. There was the 
olive oil and there were three spices that were compounded or four spices that were compounded with the olive oil to produce the anointing oil and of course the anointing oil which christ means that the anointed one so the olive oil signifying christ's divinity the mouth signifying christ's death the cinnamon signifying the effectiveness of Christ's death, the calamus signifying Christ's resurrection, and the cassa signifying the power of his resurrection. We don't have time to dwell in it here, but in the other video teaching, we, we talk more about this. Christ as the Spirit as revealed in the New Testament is on our YouTube page, the all-inclusive Christ. But just suffice to say that God gave, gave a prefigure of this, that it was the Lord himself in his divinity, now compounded with these four spices that produced the holy anointing, or which we think God was giving us a picture of what was going to happen that the anointing spirit or the anointed one that was going to live inside of us being the Lord will pass through these processes of death and uh, resurrection the Spirit of God, the Spirit God intended to indwell His children is the Spirit of the resurrected Christ. This is the compound, processed, and consummated Spirit of the Triune God as typified in uh, Exodus 30, 23 to 25. Just like if you have the time to go through them. Or let me just read it. Exodus chapter 30, verse 23 to 25. Exodus chapter 30. Exodus. Exodus chapter 30, verse 23 to 25. It says, and take for yourself quality spices. 22 says, moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, and also take for yourself quality spices, 500 shikus of liquid meal, half as such sweet smelling cinnamon, 250 shekels, 250 shekels of sweet smelling cane, 500 shekels of cassia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a heave of olive oil. Verse 25, and you shall make from this a holy anointing or an ointment compounded according to the art of the perfume it shall be the holy anointing or of course the anointed one is the lord jesus christ himself the messiah so god we believe was given a picture there's so much to that but we don't have the time we've dealt with it in another in another video lesson but there's so much that is embedded in the holy anointing or which was a type of who the lord jesus christ was going to become upon his resurrection the lord spoke to his disciples in john 14 20 16 to 18 like we mentioned earlier indicating that the comforter who would come was just was just himself in another form because we can see the he in act in john 14 17 john 14 17 the he there is just the same person that he was referring to. If you go through John 14, 17 says that the spirit of truth, of course, this is the truth. He has said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. The spirit of truth would the father, would the or in some translation, the spirit of reality that is making real to making real in our life what he died for and resurrected uh, for. The spirit of truth, whom the father, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. Because the disciples, it was only the Lord they knew. And he, for he dwells with you. We believe he was talking about himself and will be in you. And he now said, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. So the E in 14 is just the I in 14, 18, 14, 20, John 14, 20, John 14, 28, John 15, 4. That if you abide in me and I will abide, we don't know because he said the Holy Spirit will abide with us forever. And in chapter 15, he now said that he will abide in us, whoever abides in us. So, do we have two abiding in us? We don't think so because the scriptures also have told us that the Lord is the Spirit. And also, John 17 23, where he was praying to the Father, I in them, and John 17 26, or so, I in them, that you, that day you will know I am in the Father, you in me, and I in you. And what a joy for what the Lord has done for us. So, we hear some other things in the Bible. We go to the scriptures and the new testament and you almost be confused if you are not careful if, if the lord doesn't open our eyes for example who have the believers received colossians 2 verse 6 says that we have received christ as you have received christ so walk in him galatians 3 2 says that we have received the spirit did we receive two different <laughs> because excuse me if Maybe some school of thought that these are two to the extreme that Christ is Christ, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit, they are not together, they don't have any union. Then you come into trouble when you see that, and these are just a few. There are a lot of other places as well where you see that the Galatians 3 2 says that, so which is right? Is it Colossians 2 6 or is it Galatians 3 2? It's because the Lord is the Spirit. Here is another part. So that the Colossians 2 6 says that we walk in Christ. Galatians 5 16 says that we should walk in the Spirit. So if you, if you say that they are extreme to the extreme, that they are separate, <laughs> that you can separate them then you're saying that oh should i walk in christ on monday and on tuesday i walk in the spirit and on wednesday i walk in christ then we got into a sort of 
confusion. But the Lord has said that the Lord is the soul. To walk in Christ is to walk in the Spirit. To receive Christ is to receive the Spirit. Also, fellowship. First Corinthians 1 9, 9, 9 say God is faithful. Who has called us into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ? So, God has called us into fellowship of His Son. First Corinthians 1 9. 2 Corinthians, the last, <laughs> the first chapter of the of the epistle of Corinthians, the last chapter of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13, he now says that our fellowship is with the Holy Spirit. So why are we having fellowship? Is it with the Son? 1 Corinthians 1 9, or is it with the Spirit? Because if you think that they are extreme, that they are separate to the extreme, then we fall into the problem. So do I fellowship with the Lord in the morning and in the afternoon? I fellowship with the Holy Spirit and when I'm going in the night. That's why even in the book of Acts, they said they saw the disciples that they have been with Jesus. And we also see that they were filled with the Spirit. I say, okay, how can they be filled with the Spirit? And they say they've been with Jesus. It's because the Lord is the Spirit. He received the Spirit from the Father. So the Spirit is called the Spirit of the resurrected Lord, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God's Son. What a joy, what a joy. And also, another context we could use for this is also, who is, who, who is the one giving us life? John 6, 63 says, it is the Spirit that gives life. And you and I know, 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says, The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So who is the one giving us spirit, life? Is it the Son or is it the Spirit? It's because the Lord, now the Lord is the Spirit. Also, I think it's Ezekiel 2, 2. It said that the Spirit enter into me when He speak unto me. So when the Son speaks the Word of God, the Spirit comes inside. It's because the Lord and the Spirit are one. He said, well, the words that I've spoken unto you, they are spirit and they are life. What a joy, what a glory for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He breathed himself as the Holy Spirit into the disciples in John 20, 22. In John 6, 3, he said that the words that he speaks, they are spirit and they are life. It's also the spirit of life going by Romans 8, 2. The spirit and Christ are just one. This is the mystery of Christ. And we get into it. We summarize in the picture in the last four or five slides. By breathing into the disciples, he himself as the Holy Spirit came into them. From that John 20, 22. Also, the Holy Spirit is the very breath that the Lord breathed into the disciples. So that breath is simply Christ. <laughs> that breath we believe that that breath is simply Christ, that we don't think he will breathe something else. He breathed himself into them because God was in Christ. Christ is not separate from God. It's not separate from the Father. They are in separate. We say, I and the Father, we are one. In 1 John chapter 2, it said, maybe 1 John chapter 1, it said that, um, that our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. In chapter 2 of 1 John, the epistle of 1 John, it says that he who denies the Son denies the Father. He who has the Son has the Father. He kept using, and you see a lot of the epistles, the opening prayers are always grace, uh, I mean, that uh, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, always. Like in Titus, he calls God the Savior. He also called Christ the Savior. So who is our Savior? Do we have two Saviors? But what a mystery to the God that we serve, that what is beyond every human understanding. Also, here is uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 5 to 6. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Yes, another book. So, I mean, it's all through the New Testament that God washed us from by regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit that God, because the Holy Spirit is not separate from God the Father. <laughs> it's not separate. It's, they, are, they, are, they are the same. First John 5 and these three are one. They are distinct, yes, from our own human understanding, but they are inseparable. So God now says that He poured out the Holy Spirit on us through Jesus Christ. He said He poured Him out abundantly because the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. When the Lord resurrected from the dead, what a joy. Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And every one of us, Yes, Acts 2.33, the Message Bible Translation, and every one of us here is a witness to it. Then raised to the heights at the right hand of God and receiving the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he poured out the Spirit he had just received. So he, upon his ascension, he received the Spirit from the Father. How? Oh, I don't know. The scripture just said he received the Spirit from the Father. And he now poured it out. We don't think he received it external from himself. He received it and upon pouring out the Spirit on the disciples, he was actually baptizing us and baptizing disciples into one body because we have one body. Or if I could even read from 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13. 
we have to read a lot of scriptures because it's uh, there are not so many materials we could find out on the lord as the spirit or he came back as the spirit so first corinthians 12 13 says that for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body of course the body of the lord jesus christ whether jews or greeks whether slaves or free and have all been made to drink into one spirit and of course going by uh, john 17 john chapter 7 he said that if anyone tests let him come to him and drink <laughs> so do we drink from the christ or are we drinking from the spirit it's because the lord is the spirit john 7 says that he said that if anyone tests let him come to him and drink for out of their belly shall flow rivers of living water this is speaking of the spirit and first corinthians 12 13 says that what that we are all made to drink from one spirit is because the lord is the spirit <laughs> what a joy upon resurrection he is the spirit he is the spirit what a joy we praise him we adore him the lord has a life-giving spirit because the scripture says so please it's not because i said so we are all human agents we are all vessels that the lord is using as many that god has called but we are not the one we are not trying to get credit or trying to get some kind of uh, five star from the teaching no 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 it's to eulogize him to praise him that you are the healer you are our savior you are also the life-giving spirit first corinthians 15 45 and also the, now the lord is the spirit the spirit of jesus christ the holy spirit the spirit of god the spirit of the son of the living god christ has resurrected and received the holy spirit from the father the spirit is now the ascended christ but he who is joined to the lord is one spirit with him first corinthians 6 17 i mean the scriptures are overwhelming it's not just two three scriptures. we are not just trying to make a doctrine out of one scripture but this are this is first corinthians 6 17 that he who is joined to the lord is one spirit with him because the lord is the spirit and we can go through galatians 4 4 now but when the fullness of time had come god sent forth his son in the likeness of sinful flesh who was born of a woman i could read that it's because of the space that's why we didn't have all the um uh we didn't quote everything that is in there galatians chapter 4 verse 4 but when the fullness of time had come god sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption as son and because you are sons god has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart crying out abba father so god sent him twice the Lord was sent twice. First, he sent him for our redemption because he came born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us and so that we can receive the adoption as sons. And the second time he sent him, which is that first Corinthians 15, 45, that the, that the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, he said that because you are son, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. So here is this one for our transformation. Here is for our redemption. And we have a different video teaching on that, on the two becomings of Christ, or the two becoming that he became flesh, of course, for our redemption. He became the life-giving spirit for our transformation today. What a joy, what a joy. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive Christ, just as when we receive the Son, we receive the Father. Say, so he who honors the Father, who honors the Son, honors the Father. So he who denies the Son, denies the Father. He who acknowledges the Son, <laughs> acknowledges the Father. So when we receive the Holy Spirit, we are receiving Christ. When we receive Christ, we are receiving Because the Holy Spirit is the gift of God, and the Son is the gift of God as well. <laughs> we don't have multiple gifts from God in this context. God actually gave himself to us. It is still the same God. God as the Father, God as the Son, God as the Holy Spirit. He has the liberty, he has the right, the sovereignty to use whatever title he decides for himself. Say so God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So when the Lord was here, he wasn't just one thought of the God Head. that was god in the son by the spirit how do you explain that is a mystery god in the son by the spirit came in incarnation went through human living went through death and resurrected to become a life-giving spirit god could not give his life except he had gone through the process of death and resurrection an apple seed cannot release the apple fruit except it goes through death and resurrect that was what the lord said in john 12 24 so god in christ by the spirit went through death passed through death and resurrected to become a spirit that gives life they could not give their life to us 
the Spirit of God in the Old Testament, God could not release His life. That's why I said in John 10, I have come that they may have life. In John 6, 63, it's, it's John 6, 63, that it is the Spirit that quickeneth, that the flesh profit not, it is the Spirit that gives life. So He said, The words I speak, don't you, they are spirit and they are life. Second Corinthians 3 also says that it is the Spirit that gives life. The letter kill it, but the Spirit gives life. What a joy. So the decession of Christ as the Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 22. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit and grace to us. Amen. So the Lord is the one with our spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one with us because the Lord is the Spirit. What a joy for what the Lord has done for us in redemption. So in summary, today we've been able to look at Christ as the Spirit. He actually never left. He came back as the Spirit. We looked at John chapter 14 and we talked about of how the Lord said He was going away but He was coming back. He came back, we believe, in another form as the life-giving Spirit because there are other scriptures and the epistles that give further. He said it in John 16 that He has a lot of things to say but they could not comprehend it. But when the Spirit of Truth is come, He is the Truth. He is the Spirit of Truth. So he's, when He comes, He will uh, guide us into all truth. And um, of course in the epistles we see a lot of the things that uh, we can see that how God was now unveiling himself that now the Lord is the Spirit and in Revelation, the, title, the full title is the Revelation of Jesus Christ of that book the Lord himself calls himself the Spirit seven times, so we dare not say the Lord is not the Spirit, but this just glory, makes us to glorify God, to glorify the Son, to glorify, to honor the Holy Spirit to honor the Father, to honor the Son, to honor the Holy Spirit, because these three are one, the Father, the Son and the Spirit, First John 5, 7, that these three are one. That's why the church fathers came up with the time, the Trinity, the triune God, the three, one God. It's three, is one. Is one, is three. It's a mystery beyond our understanding. What a joy. We said that Christ is far beyond our knowledge. We said also that Christ uh, first uh, in Isaiah 9, 6 that is called the eternal father and 2 Corinthians 3, 17 is called the spirit and it's also the son of God as well. We said that very much he went through death and resurrection to become a life-giving spirit. Acts 2, 33, he receive the holy the promised holy spirit from the father and he now poured it on the disciples so there are two aspects of our receiving the spirit there's the breath which happens in john 20 22 when he breathed into the disciples upon resurrection on the resurrection day and there's also the outpouring which happened on the day of pentecost 50 days later when he poured out himself on the disciples baptizing them into one body today when we pray and we fellowship with him he fills us with his spirit and what a joy for what the lord has done he had to become a spirit to live in us to transform us to conform us to his very image and his likeness what a joy to what the lord has done hallelujah to the all-inclusive christ Praise the Lord. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. That's why He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.